This is what I would call a show and tell um, conversation because David uh, has a lot to show and a lot to say. Uh, and I'm just going to push him uh, to uh, compress his very long career now and the very wide range of his work uh, into some hour of interesting conversation, which uh, maybe gives you an introduction, if you do not know his work, uh, to how he thinks and what he does. And if you do know a bit about it, to maybe talk uh, through some more issues that have come out of recent work that he's uh, produced. Um, now, for me, uh, David's work is, uh, started out um, as, well, when I first came across his work, I understood it to be uh, a very complex reflection on the relationship between ways of representing and what is represented. Um, it seemed to me that uh, he was working at a moment where photographs were over, where video was over. Uh, this is in the late 90s, mid-late 90s, where the idea that you could have one medium that related directly to its object was in some kind of crisis. David's early works, or the ones which I um, was most impressed by at the beginning, use digital construction of multiple um, imaging uh, to recreate objects, to recreate scenes, uh, to recreate spaces. Uh, at the same time, he was also uh, working on very uh, elaborate uh, projects where space, time, and duration are combined in very uh, unusual ways. So, um, I, th I think we'll probably look at a few of these uh, in a few moments, but um, it's the aspect of construction in David's work, which is often uh, based in very high levels of technical uh, compositing um, and assemblage, um, ask us to uh, question whether there is uh, a stable thing being represented. It also uh, asks us to uh, wonder whether the thing that is there, that is supposedly so elaborately, authentically constructed, uh, really has uh, the presence and the uh, authenticity that it is being accorded. Um, I think we, to start though, um, it might be best to, to start with a most recent example because in many ways the uh, works that you've been working on in the last couple, two, three years, uh, put, draw on some of the earlier composite uh, uh, works, the works which uh, used multiple position, camera positions and digital compositing to create artificially simulated spaces, but do so with much more recent technology, computer-generated technology. So I, will, I would like to maybe introduce the audience to uh, Olympia, perhaps, uh, which is a very particular work uh, that is, yeah, and also then maybe talk about the king or king as well, because these, I think, quickly set up some of the conceptual scenery or the conceptual environment of what David has been doing. Um, <clears throat> so as I'm the video jockey, I'm having to look a little bit into my collection of discs. So um, I think Olympia, for most people, including you, JJ, is um, uh, something uh, recent or you haven't seen much about it. And that's because it's uh, also, it had, the project has started on the 15th of March 2016, uh, but is uh, biologically alive, one could say. It's a culmination of ideas and things that I've been working on in the past decade or 15 years. And um, if I would die tomorrow, I might say this has been the project of my life. And I think before Olympia, um, it's 
Bordeaux piece, which is dating back to 2004, which would be sort of the, the predecessor uh, to this work. It's a study of uh, light and changing situations during the course of a summer day. Uh, in the background, within the foreground, actors repeating their lines and repeating uh, a short film, which looks as if it's in a loop, but it's actually being replayed or reenacted again and again and again. Um, well, that's the title. It's a long title, I'm sorry for that, but it's sort of necessary. And um, of course, I'm not going to be able to work for a thousand years onto this project, but I do hope when I have finished uh, this computer program, we're in fact speaking about a computer program, um, when I, let's say, when I die, uh, somebody or a studio or the people who have the rights for the work, that's usually how it goes when it goes into certain collections. This is a distributed or a shared right for, for a copyright, one could say. And those people or those owners could decide to continue the next um, century or half a century for the development of this work. Now, um, I'm going through some images which sometimes randomly have dates on them, sometimes not. That's just because I'm, I'm working on it continuously. Um, the idea goes back to many visits that I have paid to the Olympic Stadium in Berlin, which is um, nowadays, of course, one of the hot tourist attractions in, uh, in, in Berlin. Um, because it's one of these icons of Third Reich propaganda that stand more or less intact. Um, it was outside of the battle zone and later on it was occupied by the different forces um, either as a sports field or as um, well I remember the British had actually uh, the Queen parading um, uh, on the sports field in the 1970s. Uh, so it was largely forgotten until of course uh, the unification of Germany and in 2005 it was uh, profoundly restored for the World Cup uh, in Germany, the World Football Cup in Germany. Since then uh, uh, an artificial roof is floating above the building and um, it's something the Germans do very well that is restoring uh, heritage in a way which kind of neutralizes um, a little bit of the content of the of the place. Um, but I, I had been visiting this place several times and one summer day, I think, in 2009 or 2010, um, I got the idea to uh, make this thousand-year project, which would be um, nature, nature versus architecture or the growth of grass and weeds and trees versus the decay of a building uh, in real time. And since the beginning, I enjoyed very much the idea of real time because nobody would really be able to see the piece the way they would expect it. Nobody would be able to see the piece in the future because you can only see it while it's happening. And um, real time means that my computer program needs to um, simulate the seasons, the decay of the materials. So I worked with architect and uh, a biologist and a material expert, among other people, uh, but also got advice from a simple gardener on how the grass is growing and how it turns into weeds and what's the what it is when nature gets a free hand in a building. My, my main example was, of course, as you may guess, uh, Chernobyl and Pripyat in Ukraine, because that place has been untouched for 25 years now, actually exactly 25 years, and um, a lot has changed climate-wise. It's, it's not similar, but it's also continental climate the way uh, Berlin has it. Uh, winters are quite different. 
Um, so there were some comparisons as a starting point. And um, we started developing with my small team uh, this um, Olympia project about, I would say, three years ago. Um, and um, made a digital model from the building uh, by actually scanning, scanning the whole building with, um, well, this is very technical, but it's a huge pole full of cameras walking around the building. It looks very silly, but it's a very efficient way of, of capturing the place the way we would see it. And my um, uh, ultimate goal was to put every stone in the building on the exact geographical location. Because I knew that one day it would be seen by Berliners and they would like to check how precise I have been, so I didn't want it to fail <laughs> in case. So, I, in fact, it was just I wanted to be, uh, I wanted to step into the, um, into the uh, precision that actually went into building this place, which is the reason why I did it like that. And the images that you're seeing here are um, taken from the computer program, so they're screen grabs. They're not photos I made, they were done automatically um, by a small computer program that runs side by side with the actual program and that um, takes a snapshot every five minutes, randomly. So whatever the weather changes or the seasons or snow or thunder or rain, um, we gather these, um, these images. So every morning, like a farmer, I get up and I'm ready to harvest um, new material, which will never come back and which has never been. So it's a way of living in a sort of matrix of uh, virtual reality, but also rather biologically linked to um, a project that once upon a time was, of course, a um, criminal utopian uh, project of a thousand years Reich, that to the side. Um, so I think, JJ, this is also the first that you know about this. Uh, I've, I've seen a little bit about it, but uh, or seen a little snatch of the, the piece and understood the, the basics of it, but um, it's, first of all for me, it's, um, uh, it seems to connect to many of your other works in as much as there is something which is both very present but it's also uh, completely absent. Uh, there's a bit of a caricature of, of some of the themes in many of your, that go through your work but it's a way to start to uh, discuss the, the place of this very high attention to reproduction and then why that then produces an object which is uh, very much about absence. I mean, in a funny way, when you say that you expect people not to be able to see this because of time, because of the duration of the piece, um, that it's impossible to see it all. Of course, we know this with quite a number of artworks by other artists that have started to exploit digital simulation as a durational issue. But here also the piece is about uh, the decay of a real object. So as you say, at some point, the history of the decay of this simulation may be different to what is the decay of the real thing. And yet, uh, nobody will be there to witness it. Okay? And nobody can witness the entirety of it anyway. So it means that there's also a thing for me about uh, what we assume to be uh, a representation of something we can, we can understand because we won't see this in its entirety. And this, tells, this asks a, then I guess a question about what, what a representation is and what an object is. And that comes then to other things that you, you know, that leads me to other things that you have done. Because the question is, if it's impossible to um, apprehend as an entire thing, then is it, uh, is it what we call a, a representation? Uh, is it an image? Or is it a reality in its own right? Now, 
I think, for example, if we were to look at a Bordeaux piece, which I think is as mentioned is a sort of long uh, an ancestor of this in a way. What's interesting with Bordeaux piece is that you are you think you are watching a drama, a narrative, a little story about a love triangle between a father, a son, and his and their lover. Um, and it is repeated over and over again by the same actors. It's not like a performance in a theater, because the thing which is completely different each time is the duration of the time of day in which the drama is repeated. And what always struck me about that piece is that um, you are watching the same object, you think, but there's something else which is actually there. Um, which is the time of day, and which criss crosses and conflicts with the time of the drama. So a drama can be repeated every time you read, every time you read, I don't know, uh, a story by you know, Raymond Chandler, or you watch uh, a play or a musical. You know there's a script. You know if it's a film, you know that there is a set sequence to it. But what is interesting, if we look at Bordeaux piece, so that people can become a bit familiar with it, is that two different times uh, are in opposition to each other. And so what I find interesting there is that there is some other thing. There's another object elsewhere. There's something which is invisible that you can't see. Something along those lines. Now this may be, uh, this may be to do with this idea of absence which floats around your work, and which I'm interested in. Something which is supposed to be there, but which isn't. You're being given an alibi for the work, whereas what is, in, is in some way, that, alib that it, what is represented, the image, is uh, an, an alibi for something which is escaping, disappearing, which I find very interesting. And it's something to do with the relationship between real and representational. Um, have you got a Bordeaux piece to, to I do, Sorry, I do, yeah. actually. Um, when you, don't, you can't show the dogs yet. Or, or, sorry, the, wolves. The, the, the what? The, uh, you no, can't no, show no, the no. Disney stuff okay. yet. Okay, so I really just want to show one thing, but he's not allowing no, you're me. not yet. No, yet. <laughs> and we've got to look at Elvis too, so, but, but <laughs> not yet. Um, Bordeaux piece, I think. <laughs> um, here. I don't get to push artists around. Yeah, a bit. <laughs> Usually. 13 hours and 43 minutes, yeah. um, which of course pushes a little bit, but nowadays, you know, it's very usual to have artists coming with statements of hours long projects, of which they hope that the public will actually not see most of it. Um, but um, this was a little bit harder on mainly the actors because they had to physically perform um, the same lines in front of a backdrop which is in almost imperceptibly changing. It's really only the position of the sun which is moving. And the difference, of course, with the virtual Olympia, which is completely done in virtual reality in the computer, um, based upon a lot of analogical material. And this is that this has all been done in real flesh and in action. Um, and represents this, a, a summer day in a, in a location. In fact, the dichotomy in Bordeaux piece was initially simple, and I usually, I can't help it, but I have rather brutal, unpolished ideas initially, uh, was that um, foreground and background would go in a certain dialogue, and that the background would be like the old wizard, um, never saying anything, but just witnessing. And that the background would essentially be a witness of time, and of the uh, things unfolding. And at that time, I think in 2004, I still had a lot of ambitions with working with um, the moving image and maybe with cinematography, which I gave up by now, um, well, for many reasons, but the, good, the best reason is I've seen that artists actually don't make anything of cinematography when they, once they get the, the chance. Um, 
So I, I, will, mean? I will not get into that trap. <laughs> well, we know the people that have done this and only rarely successful uh, because you see the hand of the producer too much. So I really wanted to be my own producer. That was the, 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 my, my, my uh, um, issue. So the, artists are, uh, the, the actors are being punished very hard in Bordeaux piece because they are very tired. They, they shot, you shot it in a two days or a day? No, we shot it in, in fact, we shot it in almost a month okay. because the condition was that it would be beautiful weather. Ah. And um, it was filmed, uh, of course, on near to the Atlantic coast, so the weather is very, very instable. And bad luck, as always, strikes when uh, you need good weather. We had rain, so <coughs> it became more and more complex because you have to understand we had to make a short film of 10 minutes looking in the same setting or looking similar in the same sunny setting and we had to have a, a precise script of which parts were still missing like this number five shot we only have in the rain so we need to do that in sun so at the end the last two weeks were just filled with running from one situation to the next, trying to record um, something that we should have had already in good weather, but where the, the clouds came in. Um, so this became a big sun study, combined with actors that were increasingly um, irritated uh, by what they had to do, and felt, of course, manipulated as objects. Um, like in the good Alfred Hitchcock sense, that they, you would really trash them around. Um, and I'm, I'm still uh, indebted to them for keeping this up. But um, one actor told me the first day, he said, we had, the first day was a wonderfully beautiful day. And he said, uh, so we were able to work from 5 o'clock in the morning until, five, uh, until 9 o'clock in the evening without interruption. And he said, David, you know, you can really break an actor this way. Uh, you can make us have enough of our job for the rest of our lives. Um, and actually, you know, I have a small film. Um, where do I have that? This three-minute sequence. Oh, yeah, I think I have it here, right here. So that's just... I, I, I just edited a few seconds of each film so that you see how the sun goes up while the actor is repeating his lines. This must be 6.30 in the morning or something like that. I'm leaving for Berlin in half an hour. You call me, I'm leaving for Berlin in half an hour. So he plays the role of a film producer. And I'm leaving for Berlin. We stole this loosely from Jean-Luc Godard. Without really wanting to pay an homage to Godard. In, in uh, Le Mépris. Me, I'm, I'm leaving for Berlin in half an hour. Mm. Me? So how many? Um, I'm leaving in half an hour. How many Berlin. times did they do it in the end, all in all? Uh, Are you calling me? I think it must I'm have been 75 Berlin. times half acting every time. Yeah. What me? I'm leaving for Berlin. Half an hour. You call me. What me? I'm leaving for Berlin. Half an hour. What me? I'm leaving for Berlin. Half an hour. Hmm? Hey. So, I mean, leaving. the idea with all this labor Half and an time is that yes. um, nowadays I'm it's I'm very expensive, and I like to show Half it as something that's very accessible. That's why I hard I'm work <laughs> and a lot of time. Me, I'm leaving for Berlin. But here, then, then the, the, two, the two things that yeah. work what? against each other, I like, I like the idea of the wizard, the, 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 the house in the background being mm. the sort of silent what? wizard. Me? I'm leaving for but Berlin. But it's interesting yeah. to see the difference what? between I'm leaving for Berlin. supposedly the Half scenery, yeah. the objects of the mm. landscape what? of the house, Me? I'm, I'm leaving um, for, uh, Berlin. become almost... What? Me, on the, the same level as the actors who they oh, no. start to lose their mm. what? magic. Me, I'm, I'm leaving they me. lose the capacity to oh, generate no. this narrative 
fictional space, which is also to do with uh, a cinema culture of editing that produces a narrative. Because if you, if you sit through this and you watch it, you become desensitized, you become tired of the actors acting their ridiculous little drama with this crazy little uh, antagonism between the, the, this older man, this younger man, and this woman. Um, and you start to feel that they are uh, as um, material as everything around them. So the, the big uh, clash is between different ways of, um, the tension is between these different ways of expecting uh, content, or expecting significance, to, 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 or meaning. Uh, how do we get meaning out of something? If we look at a, at a landscape painting, we appreciate uh, not a landscape, but a painting that does certain things, produces certain effects. But when it's crossed with another mode of meaning making, of, signif of signifying, it produces a kind of uh, conflict and tension. So it's that technical uh, uh, disjunction between the, 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 the conventions and the, and the norms that we, the, the, yes, the norms that we expect. Uh, in art forms, like cinema, like photography, like literature, like stagecraft, um, and so on. It's that disjunction which produces a, a sense of um, conflict around what the object is. That's what interests me on, on these, in a lot of, a lot of these works. Um, <clears throat> and for some re reason it produces this sensation or this uh, perception or this kind of uh, suspicion that there is something else elsewhere which is not present, which is this business of absence. Um, may I ask you to talk about the Disney Jungle Book project? Because this, in a funny way, I mean, there's also this, as absence as a sort of, um, uh, um, as, an, as a motif seems to come up in all kinds of different forms. So, uh, the whole, the whole object of Olympia is absent, because you'll never see it. Um, there is absence in, of, in these other earlier videos because we're not quite sure what we're supposed to be looking at. And in this Jungle Book uh, project, there's a very ob ob obvious other kind of absence, which is the removing of all the humans, all the human presence from the Disney version of the Jungle Book. Well, maybe you want to explain this a little bit. Um, the, it's, the, the working title was Die Reine Notwendigkeit, or we called it Jungle Book after uh, this famous 1967 Disney animation with uh, Mowgli, The Adventures of Mowgli and Baloo the Bear, and, which somehow, um, if you think 1967, 1968, this is full high modernity, um, slowly preparing for post-modernity in a way, in around the mid-70s. Um, but there's this incredible positivistic and rhythmic energy um, that if you educate somebody, if you take care of the weak, and even if you throw the weak into the mouth of the lion, so to speak, it's possible that through generosity and through the miracle of modern man that somehow everything turns well and um, life becomes a feast. And so I was in fact working on a, on a completely different project with animals um, a few years ago when I, uh, for some reason, had via YouTube, I had the film of Jungle Book, the animation, open on my laptop. And I think I hadn't seen it for maybe 40 years. And came the end of the film with the song of the girl going to the pond with the water, getting the water, and then going back home and seeing Mowgli, and Mowgli going back to the village of the humans, saying goodbye to the animals. It's a very uncanny effect that 
um, but the time that I had seen it last must have been when I was age eight or ten, and now that I had the feeling that I'd never forgotten about the music, and so I wasn't sure if this was magic or, or horror. Um, and in an instant, the old idea that I was working on had um, finished, never touched it again, and I, I realized I wanted to... Um, came a new idea, was to take away um, most anthropomorphic qualities in the, anim in the animation of the original Disney film. Um, I thought initially that I would be able to do this by, uh, by cutting out scenes and by copy-pasting it like we would usually do. Uh, but I realized slowly that this was going to be a little bit more complicated. Um, and somehow I wanted this to be exactly one hour, ending significantly with the song of the girl that comes to take the water exactly at the hour, as a sort of domesticated girl that does um, programmed what she needs to do for the rest of her life. She's singing it in the song, by the way, she will pick this for her, fa for her husband, and then cook in the home, and then she picks the water every hour. And then the, the, the rest of the hour would be filled with animals, basically in a zoo, but functioning like zombies, as if they had no more, as if they just had a past. And I always imagined children, you know, hitting the screen and saying, like, come on, Baloo, do something. And he wouldn't actually respond. Um, the same, of course, with, uh, with Bagheera. So we, we, me and my same poor studio, we, we set out on a new project. And we tried this in, in the, the way our method, which would be 3D, but we failed completely. I can show you some images of it if you would be interested. It looks ridiculous, but that's a, a part of the process. Uh, but by that time, a few that we were a few months in the project when I realized that even that, you know, this approach didn't work. We would have to hire professionally skilled um, traditional animators. Um, and there started this adventure of drawing frame by frame the whole film um, with these people. It became a team of about I think, 10 to 12 people that worked for between one year and three years at the studio. Um, and where you're seeing here a director's cut is this 15 minutes out of one hour. The bear was, of course, yeah, maybe the favorite subject because he's dancing all the time in the, in the original, and so to make him calm down um, was all, meant making him feel depressed, in a way, without a lot of energy. Uh, but it goes back to what you said a moment ago, JJ, um, is that what I'm looking for is not a, something new, and it's also not an homage to Jungle Book, but it's a thing in between. It's a certain temporality in between, where temporality becomes um, tactile, something that you might actually feel here and now. And, and there are these a few components of modern life which has be, have become uh, dirty words, and that is time. Time is one of them, because time is atomized in small parts and is, it's money. Uh, so there's none of it, which means that the logic of our lives is very often that of loss and regret, because of course we are losing it all the time. And the other thing would be labor, which we mentioned briefly. Um, labor, which is of course uh, increasingly expensive and um, needs to be outsourced <laughs> to cheaper places or, or, automa or automated uh, with the computer. And it's precisely the computer that I'm trying to, you know, I always work with my enemies. I, I'm good at collaborating with my enemies. And that would be computer automatization, um, cinema. <laughs> These are, uh, I invite them in, uh, in a way.
Uh, but that's the latest project, and this has recently been um, uh, accomplished or finished. Um, this, you mentioned that uh, memory, is, uh, memory and time um, have uh, a part to play in what you do. Um, and again, a lot of what you do is about the trace of something uh, in time and the loss of the origin of it in time, too. In a funny way. So there is a, so many of the works in which you have a still image which you've essentially entirely reconstructed so that the viewer can go through it or be in the space in three dimensions in a, certain, in a particular way. Uh, is also about uh, somehow um, memorializing uh, and through exaggeration uh, and yet somehow Remind, you know, going back to the conclusion that the thing is lost. What's interesting about talking about the remembering seeing a film, a number of critics and not, you know, writers talk about the experience of remembering images in cinema. Um, what's interesting about talking of, about forgetting The Jungle Book is that now I, I watch this and I wonder whether this is authentic. I can't remember now, having also probably seen The Jungle Book when I was in my, you know, when I was eight or something, uh, whether these are scenes which have any real origin in the film. Uh, so the idea of watching these animals do nothing very much goes against the, again, first of all, goes against that kind of demand for narrative or time that has meaning. Uh, and it also demands that it's also provoking the uh, question as to what, um, what origin is at stake? Or, you know, what, is the, what is the original? They look original, but actually the more you're talking about it, the more you start to be suspicious that these are actually uh, disembodied, like you say, zombies zombie characters, who have been let go of their responsibilities to exist meaningfully, and have been returned back to the wild. Which, of course, you know, animals in the wild, they don't do very much. I'm not an environmentalist, and I don't, I don't watch nature videos for the drama, right? <laughs> and I, this is what animals do. They spend their time not knowing that they're spending their time. Uh, and that's a human characteristic which is peculiar about human beings. They narrate their own time. So there's, um, so there's something quite strange about producing a very fictional, produced, industrially manufactured version of nature, right? of, the, of there being no time in the human sense. That makes sense. Um, <clears throat> well, it brings me to um, <clears throat> there's, <clears throat> there's all sorts of concepts that have been moved to the trash bin, one could say, of of um, human efficiency, and uh, the one of the, of course, time as uh, uh, an efficiency tool and what happens when you are actually interested more in vacant time um, this is thing I don't know vacant time and, and, and we don't have that in in, Nether in, the, in Dutch or in Netherlands language as um, available time um, but actually it's probably maybe best understood as available time uh, one could say holidays <coughs> um, so the other thing being labor, but then of course also efficiency, the need for to wrap it up in a few words and a few lines and to actually be able to generate thumbnails of work. Very essential in an art world or in a world at large where uh, everything gets its five minutes in the limelight and then actually uh, sort of categorized next to it. So, when I'm when I when I'm able to do things, it's only on the condition that I'm that I'm able that I'm allowed to stretch it, and to maybe generate slowly also um, 
um, a culture where the, the moving image um, is not necessarily identified with live animation in its origins, where um, people originally, let's say in the analog world, and uh, maybe we grab back to uh, the early developments of the moving image, which came as a second wave of shock after, in fact, early before the invention of photography, um, where you actually saw life unfolding while you, while you were unfolding your own life yourself. This was one of the one of the ori original uh, fetishes with the moving image: is that ah, this thing breeds. That's why we say animation. It's life. This thing breeds the way we breathe. Oh yeah, that's the end of the film. So in fact, you need to sit for one hour uh, in order to see this exactly at the hour. Uh, but I'm going to take the sound a little bit away. Um, and that very soon after the introduction of the moving image is sort of, I feel it's being hijacked by narrative and by liter lit literature, of course, uh, essentially. Um, and it has something to do with, um, I'm making this up right now, but I think it's, it's the case, with the passing, the, the way the Second World War, the First and the Second World War came. Um, they, both events disrupted social life and confidence in one another so profoundly that um, it was necessary to have an intermediate which became cinema and, or television. Um, to be able to sit together in front of something that emits light and that tells something without actually having to speak to one another. Uh, without actually having to bring back the painful stuff that lies right behind in our uh, short past, which was the First and the Second World War. And I think that's possibly why cinema gained the importance it did, is because it, uh, it, it was a, a, um, a, a very welcoming um, uh, moment of entering into an a stream, a stream of somebody else's uh, ideas. Um, and of course, the things that I do deconstruct all that. Um, many artists before me have done it, but um, in my generation, artists uh, gain confidence into a, a, a new platform. And that's of course the platform of, of digital, um, which uh, different, differentiates with analog in the sense that analog is defined indexically by um, the moving arrow forward. Uh, a, a piece of, of celluloid or a videotape or anything that was recorded in, a, in the analog world somehow moved forward and then had to be uh, played backwards in order to be starting again. So life, let's say life in, in animation or in, 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 in the moving image was defined as something that a certain time stretch and then had to start again. So basically you could say it was a loop. Oh, we have a well-known art fair called Loop. Maybe we should rethink the title of it because then comes digital platform which in fact uh, uh, and while I'm saying that, I was saying that 15 years ago, but it's starting to sort of age a little bit, this thesis, is that it, it, what it does, it, it makes a triangle between present, past and future, which becomes <clears throat> more or less like uh, the modern markets would do, or like late capitalism would do. It becomes, um, is that right, unhinged or disconnected? Mm -hmm from um, as many as possible analog, real-life anchorings. Um, and it becomes floating. So, uh, w w my work is situated um, into that new sphere of being, you, one could say, if I can continue to speak in metaphors, being ac absolutely lost in this river, in this floating river where uh, you have no more connections, 
and you slowly start to use, lose your biological connections as well. Uh, and I think this probably has prompted in, in, in my work um, to look from memory as if I am blind and as I, I, I am buried uh, somewhere underground from memory dig out the phenomenological truths like duration, uh, the pas passage of the day, um, or uh, the semi-zombie existence of the, the animals, the way, actually what you said, I didn't, I didn't reflect on that before in, in, in the Jungle Book piece, um, because that's what they do, they just spend their lives doing nothing. And when you have it on screen, you, all, you have a, an in-between space. So this has been most of the oc occupation of what I've done, despite the heter heterogeneity of, of many of the, f the works that don't look alike. Mm -hmm. um, it's, I think that's probably, it's probably good to finish on one other sequence, which is King, if you wouldn't mind. Um, because I think that, that turn in the, which comes out of the 1990s, uh, and the emergence of the digital um, breakdown of the analog linear temporal uh, injunction or compulsion um, is is also the turn to digital also turns uh, the relationship between index object and image inside out Hollywood actually spends a lot of tr time trying to suppress the analog, right? So classic Hollywood cinema is full of artifice because classic mainstream cinema, popular cinema, does everything it can to escape the analog index of the camera, the actor, the lights, uh, the, the, the film going through the gate, and so on. In that same time, uh, art, film, and art, and experimental and, and uh, oppositional filmmaking did two things particularly. One is the return to the index, which is durational. So you have durational video for coming out of the, in the 70s uh, and, and in the late 60s film, uh, experimental film, which is also uh, driven by index, or it's, it's, it's driven by montage as well, which also then has its roots pre-Second World War, goes back to, say, Russian Revolution, uh, you know, uh, interwar uh, experimental film. But digital unravels all that because there's no compulsion to either return to, you know, to hold on to the immediate index, the thing in front of the camera or the thing in front of the photograph, um, or to attempt to hide in a kind of uh, literary narrative uh, fiction yeah, or invention. Um, and it, that, um, that kind of uh, collapsing of the analog and the distribution of time has its effects on how we understand the objects that we're seeing. We see them as increasingly uh, virtual, we see them as increasingly imagined. So, I mean, if you watch any constructed um, pop video now, the level of artifice is so dense and that it's a, it's a shimmering surface of uh, sign bodies and people moving and, and you know, colors flowing and so on. It doesn't matter anymore. There's really no sense of uh, any kind of tension between, say, re reality and some notion of reality being represented or misrepresented. It's not really, there's no reality to be spoken of. But, the, I mean, King is an interesting one to finish on. Um, to explain almost the perversity of um, the problem of analog and digital uh, confusions around what has been looked at. So to summarize, King is uh, a re complete recreation of, in three dimensions, of the scene uh, that was taken, uh, the scene which is depicted in a photograph of Elvis Presley at home with his family and friends, from a particular shop by a particular photographer. So you'll take it from there. In, in 1956, a German 
uh, immigrated to the United States uh, named Alfred Wertheimer was um, uh, got this job to uh, follow with his camera a young star Elvis Presley at his home in uh, he was then 21 and the picture comes from a book called Elvis Presley at 21 it's a whole collection of wonderful uh, images of uh, Elvis and um, but he wasn't yet he wasn't yet the star that he became soon after that he was really at the moment of transition um, also in 1956 we can easily say that the star system is not what it became later uh, with uh, Marilyn Monroe and so on uh, that there's still a certain hesitation um, as to how to fix how to make a kind of rigor mortis from the idol uh, which uh, Elvis Presley was and I had this idea for um, this work since many many years it goes back I think to 2002 um, and what I wanted to do was because he's half naked in the original picture he just has his swimming trousers and he comes from the, just out of the swimming pool grab the bottle of Pepsi Cola and he's looking at the photographer almost in a su suggestive way of oh you again you're still there and this photographer effectively spent an entire week which he was supposed to stay I think one or two days but because they got along well he just stuck to Elvis all the time and made this revealing uh, reportage on him and this this unguarded moment of Elvis Presley which by the way has never given one gaze one arrogant gaze to the camera you can try I challenge you never ever you can find from Elvis an angry or profoundly angry or irritated gaze to the camera this is incredible I don't know how it is possible but it's rare so this one picture is kind of stuck with me because it despite Elvis being this in it and it all being about Elvis it seemed to me that it was very much about other things like the furniture the carpet um, the varnish on the table um, the wet pants of Elvis the fact that he's not he's not looking like a star but he's looking like a young uh, adolescent uh, guy um, not really ready for the job of stardom and he's not even in the center of the picture so I set out to collect you might have seen some of the slides um, as many as possible images I could find digital and from photos online and in books of naked skin uh, by Elvis Presley so naturally his cross is never there fortunately I didn't need it um, some of the material of his legs is missing but most of the material of his upper legs of course of face and arms and hands is available and I made this sort of Dr. Frankenstein recreation of Elvis Presley as a sort of ultimate adoration of the icon with um, made out of pieces of skin which I then digitally glued on um, the body of a Elvis Presley lookalike which I had scanned and brought into the computer so that's the short story of the work um, but it might be you know it's interesting with what you mentioned there a moment ago is that you have a transitional period in 1956 you still have we're in the midst of just like in Jungle Book of a certain um, positivistic relation to photography um, where there is a, a mutual agreement or a mutual uh, a contract between the, the one who has taken the image and the subject matter of the image that they in fact existed together at one time and believe it or not but we all know by now that the whole photographic uh, undertaking was always a construct since digital and blah 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 we're kind of aware of it collectively 
that we are, what we are looking at is, is even if it's a, a pure, simple snapshot, it's a way of propaganda of something, the propaganda of looking at something. And um, so going back to 1956, you had this sort of semi-innocent uh, look at where one would say that everything that I would have touched, I could almost have touched the skin of Elvis. And I do that in the 2015, 16, very well knowing that all the skin that I'm gathering of Elvis Presley is nothing more than a concept of his skin, because most of it is, is collected digitally and is then being glued. But the fetish nevertheless keeps on existing, even today. So that's why I sort of <coughs> in futuristically sometimes claim that photography is long, has long said goodbye to, um, to us and to the way we uh, employ it in our daily lives and politics, um, but is already part of an ideology of the past. Um, but it, it is necessarily performing the rituals of what it used to be. This is what happens when you live in a matrix. The word has been used twice now, in a matrix which needs to ritualistically perform things that once existed in memory. But that most of the production then in that matrix is in fact virtual and is, um, uh, is in fact non-existent. Um, which sort of summarizes where I'm going to, I think, also in Olympia and the recent works. Uh, is there a, a shot of the, is there a still of the overall scene, just so that people can be aware of this? There are details yeah. only. But these are the simulations. Yeah, these this are, is the, are the these are details of the, of the, so I don't have the video, I think, in this keynote. But all this has, has been generated. This has all been generated, including this um, sort of Jan van Eyck um, moment where you see the entire virtual uh, room reflected into the yeah. ash tree. Um, I think we, apart from saying that it's, it's uh, I think, a, a, an interesting um, challenge to the sense of the way in which we accept um, invented imagery. Uh, you use the phrase uh, using the enemy's tools. It's always a good one to, to grab for. So it's a dramatic thing to say. Uh, but it's intriguing to see things that are uh, using the tools of manufacture and simulation and, and production mm -hmm. to do nothing. Because I remember talking a little bit about this last time we spoke, and I was laughing about so many of the uh, computer-generated films that there are now. I mean, there is so much that goes on in them, uh, and there is so much that is trivial, but is also very uh, baroque, especially in uh, fantasy sci-fi, where now computer-generated imagery can produce so much, of so, in certain ways, of so little consequence. Mm last Star Trek movie or the last um, Transformers mm -hmm. movie or whatever. Um, and it's, to, to conclude, I think it's, it is a, a very, a, perhaps quite pessimistic uh, or, or uh, bleak challenge to offer so much invention to allow some residual notion of time and memory to come back um, to us in the in an artwork. I think if that's, that might be where we're at, we are, mm. uh, but that's quite a, uh, a depress perhaps quite a depressing uh, thing to conclude um, about the current moment, and yet necessary to somehow articulate it, which I think these things do. Well, if you, if you look at the, um, and I have, I'm in the field of, um, with my studio, of production, um, we, in my studio we are capable of touching upon technologies and ideas that are uh, currently being used in a big budget uh, uh, 
um, studios and films without in fact uh, having uh, having to make them um, it did it taught me uh, that there is a really a sort of goodbye to be said to the camera and to the lens where as that also made me realize that in fact the lens um, in all its history and wh why it was invented uh, and, wh and, and the time when it was invented it's, it was no coincidence but quintessential was um, its uh, religion of light you know? um, that it only existed to the grace of light and also that photography throughout the development of um, the 20th century was essential in contextualizing and guiding what we saw happening politically in revolutions and witnessing them. And nowadays, of course, also these mechanical images seem dated, I realize that. But nevertheless, to, uh, they spoke and they speak in past tense, they spoke of um, um, they spoke in a corrective way. It was as if uh, they spoke of a lightning fast language which we didn't need to understand in order to understand it. Nobody needs to explain you what you see in a photograph in order to understand it. It was as if um, as if uh, this image culture, which is generated by, by, by the mechanical image, um, was uh, a late vengeance on, um, on writing and on linear, linear writing, uh, to quote uh, Willem Flusser one more time, um, as if it's the speed of language, that the, the speed of, uh, uh, of communication that it used, uh, would somehow prevent the worst catastrophes of happening. Yeah? Of course it didn't uh, prevent any catastrophe, but it did help to contextualize and it did actually generate modern man the way, the, the way we are today. So the, the only thing where I'm, I would also have a slightly bleak um, uh, idea of what the future brings is that I am afraid that synthetic um, images bring back ideological imagery or bring back ide ideologically constructed um, realities. Uh, in, order, in other words, uh, realities constructed by, by other, other people than ourselves or other people than this transparent, non-coded medium that photography once was. So that we would go back to a very coded reality where um, we think we individually discover things which have sort of been programmed for us. Good. It's bad. <laughs> thank you. Yes, okay, thank you very much, David. Um, we, we've spoken for an hour uh, or a bit more. And um, if you want to ask questions and make comments to us and to David, this is now the time to do that because uh, I know this we've is run out of thing, clever we things. We said to say. very intimidating things, and so I'm sorry. But well, please. just just one quick just one quick thing to throw out. It is also topical. It is also very current to talk about imagery which has and me, and um, messages which have no reference to reality anymore. There's a big discussion, big controversy since, especially since Mr. Trump made it to the White House, but it's been going on since before that, uh, that we seem to be in a situation where we're finding it very hard to distinguish between what we mean by fact, what we mean by reality, what we mean by interpretation, and what we mean by um, representation. Right? So, in, and I found myself in situations recently where I'm having to argue uh, the complicated idea that uh, there isn't such a hard and fast distinction between fact, interpretation, and fiction, even though I believe in truth, right? But 
I find myself, especially with, with regards to the space of social media that we often have to get involved with, that people, and this is something to do with fiction, people, and also to do with ideology, people of whatever political uh, or um, life perspective, people from all kinds of political and cultural perspectives prefer to represent the world to themselves the way they see it, rather than be interrogated as to whether that is representation, uh, interpretation, or reality. And it's a very, that itself actually is a very strange and, and increasingly, I think, dangerous moment uh, to be in culturally. To the point where people refuse to even acknowledge that maybe their notion of the fact, their notion of an interpretation might be in conflict with yours. But anyway, that's, that's just a bit of journalism to add to this. But um, I, I open the conversation to you now. How should we do this, by the way? First of all, thank you very much for a very in-depth uh, sort of uh, conversation uh, approaching this very beautiful work. But then, I mean, uh, I was struck by the choice of two objects. Like, the first one is Olympia, and I say objects, you know, as something that one can look at as if in a model or in a maquette. I mean, even though being such a monumental architecture, I mean, we come to look at it in a very detail, I mean, as if we were represented, representing God's eye. And, the, and in the same way, I mean, the Disney film, I mean, the, the, the Jungle Book, it, it, it looks like a reconstructed object. It's no longer a narrative. It's something, I mean, that we watch it as if it were, as if some truth were hidden in every single slow motion or gesture or sequence. So uh, I wonder, I mean, I would like you for a moment to describe those two objects, but not just as images, but as ideological constructions, if, it is, if that is possible. Uh, also because, I mean, th those are objects that they were supposed to be somehow innocent or uh, not ideologically loaded to begin with. Um, well, they're both ruins. Um, so, I, uh, out of Jungle Book, uh, I think, came this ruin of roaming animals living in the past, in a memory. When, in fact, the animals don't live in a memory, it's always in the eye of the beholder. Um, and, of course, in, uh, in Olympia, you have the future ruin. <laughs> Um, so I think um, uh, uh, working in a mediated environment is essential. So in a non sort of non non new, nothing discovered, nothing actually, in fact, most of of it appropriated. Um, the Olympia Stadium exists. The shots, the famous shots of Lenny Riefenstahl exist, the low angle shots of the things. So the whole memory of the Olympic Stadium exists. In Jungle Book even more, um, the whole memory is very vivid, ironically with children more than with adults. Um, although I think this, my Jungle Book unnerves children, I would imagine. Um, although I haven't actually tested it on children. Originally, Jungle Book was commissioned, or was going to be commissioned to be uh, integrated in a hospital, in a children's hospital. I'm very glad that didn't happen. Uh, but that was the <laughs> first idea. Uh, but so, the, the leftover and the ruin are... Um, are uh, it's a little bit like, um, you, know, I, you know, if you have to use, I, if they have to use simple images, um, uh, I would never thought I would say this, but I feel a little bit like a character from um, Blade Runner or uh, even Matrix, is that uh, it is important to know the code. Um, and that uh, technological images have in common, always, throughout history, whether you look at the brothers Van Eyck or, or, or anything, is that they have in common, they're always a step ahead in, in, in the, towards the spectator. They always have a certain magic, 
um, that has not been un unraveled uh, collectively. And then at one point they're being unraveled collectively, but then, and then somehow history goes on. Um, uh, but that uh, you you need the code masters. You need um, um, and for a long time this has been have been the filmmakers, the cinematographers, or the the producers um, that were a step ahead of the of the lecturer, or I mean of the reader of the of the, the person looking at the film, um, and that the more profoundly the world is, is um, unraveled or de decomposed in synthetic uh, reality, uh, the more we will need uh, this rebel coming out of the code, um, unraveling, uh, showing even if it's via ruins, um, but showing uh, what, what the mechanism what the mechanism behind it is. And even if it's only to, to you can't, you know, can't, we, we cannot possibly in a heroic way unravel the code. You can only give hints at how, in fact, what the ruin we are looking at. Um, so, I mean, would you dare to say that there is might be a, a maybe a pedagogy to sort of uh, learn to unravel that reality that it looks so natural, so well constructed? I mean, can someone learn to sort of distinguish, like in Matrix, you know, when you're given two pills, and you have to decide whether you want to awake or else just follow with the illusion of. Matrix? Well, the problem with the current the, the current state of or the current direction of in which incorporation I have a term for this I don't know if it's actually a correct term I call it pre-corporation, um, which is a radical form of incorporation, uh, is that you cannot possibly know um, when when you are incorporated that you are actually incorporated. So it's very hard. Somebody somebody has to has to bring you out of the out of the system and and. Um, something has to go wrong, but that's definitely from what I've learned in um, what image construction is, uh, synthetic construction is, where it goes to. We're we're on a way, we're on some kind of train track, um, which where where incorporation is quintessential, where you're no longer able to distinguish, um, and where you might actually have many alternative realities. Um, or alternative facts, was it? Yeah. <laughs> you, when, you, when you might, and maybe this, uh, it's a lapsus nowadays, uh, but it might, it might become common practice. And therefore I think also that um, um, techno technological images are always in sync with ideological images, or with ideologies. So if today we speak of Trump culture, and we speak of uh, alternative facts. Um, there is a reason why technological images also move in that path. Yeah, yeah, because it gets really, I get very agitated on this point. The Matrix is really um, um, a good caricature of a problem which it doesn't resolve. Because, of course, the Matrix is seductive because there's one key uh, by polarity or opposition in it, which is that in one case there is the illusion, there is the simulation, there is uh, the virtual world in which the people who do not know in, inhabit, and then there is the truth. There is the fact of the reality that is the authentic reality. So it's a really nice, straightforward, clear, platonic uh, opposition, which doesn't actually... Uh, correspond to what is more difficult in human life, which is that there aren't just the real and illusion. There is the process of working out, of working to find uh, what the real is, given that there is no immediate transcendental access to reality, right? This is a materialist uh, approach you know, if you read Lukash, 
the old Marxist Lukash, he's dealing with what literary fiction and reality have in relationship to each other. Reality is not naturalism. Reality is not the facts. Reality is, uh, I mean, reality is a test, you know, if you want the facts, you have to test your concept of what reality is through some form of truth testing, right? But there is no, you know, there's no polar binary opposition between authentic reality access and pure delusional, uh, you know. So this is a problem of also about the pedagogical nature of criticism and one thing which memory, some theorists and, and uh, uh, political writers have touched on in the last uh, sort of decade, which is that it's not pedagogical to teach people that they are deluded and that you know the truth. It's pedagogical to elaborate the problem of discovering what is, what is true through one's own uh, exploration. So I think for me, it's, you know, and this is why also I find it sometimes very difficult when people are shouting about post-truth and the Trump age. There are many things that people pre before Trump wanted to believe is the truth, right? And that there should be no, dis no discussion about what it is. What is reality? What is how things work? What, what is how human society operates? You know, and so on and so on and so on. So it's really interesting that we have in a period where we have an almost absolutist desire to assert that this is the facts, this is the authentic truth, the reality, nobody can deny it, climate change, right? That's the science. Or, you know, there are lots of things where people are very intolerant about an openness to interrogation. And on the other hand, there's an also an obsessive uh, quality to our culture now where we worry that everything is also illusion. So there's this kind of st strange sort of splitting now between working out what is. And so I think for in, in that respect, there may be a different, more hopeful aspect to thinking about what you do, which is also to, it is not pedagogical in terms of revealing uh, lies. It's somehow, and it's not about teaching people to know the code. It's to know that the code is always sort of code, but it's always being put to some kind of real use or human use, but that they're, they're never stable. They don't, you know, they don't go together. I mean, I remember when I saw, when I first saw Pulp Fiction, it was brilliant, because here comes a completely fictional object that destroys a whole 10 years of really crappy Hollywood filmmaking in one twist. You know, it didn't matter that it was ridiculous. Uh, but it, it abolished a style of filmmaking which had become tired and everybody had got it. So here's a new code. Try this one. You know, it doesn't make it any more real. It just makes it more alive. You know, something like that. Well, if no, there are more questions. There are questions. I imagine that it's very tired and everyone is very tired. Well, I mean, I, I guess there are more, no more questions. And if it is true that, I mean, when a work uh, raises a, a good discussion, then it's really a good work. This is the case uh, tonight. So thank you very much. Really thankful. Gracias. Thank you.